ating koneksyon sa kapaligiran. Ito ang nagbibigay impormasyon sa atin tungkol sa ating kapaligiran na nagiging basehan ng ating mga aksyon at emosyon. Ang mata ay isa sa mga pinakasensitibong bahagi ng ating katawan, kaya dapat natin ito laging protektahan. Hindi maaaring palitan ng iyong mga mata, kaya mahalagang isa alang-alang ang proteksyon nito sa bawat gawain sa iyong trabaho. Ano ang protective eyewear? Ang protective eyewear ay proteksyon sa mga mata at kung minsan ay sa mukha, gaya ng goggles o face shield na idinesenyo upang maiwasan ang aksidente. Bakit ito mahalaga? May mga trabaho na kinakailangan ng proteksyon sa mata upang maiwasan ang iba't ibang mga aksidente na maaaring makaapekto sa ating mga paningin. Mga halimbawa nito ay ang mga maliliit na butil na maaaring tumalsik sa mata habang naglalagari, nagpupukpok o nagbabarena ng mga kahoy o metal, Bukod sa mga maliliit na bagay na pwedeng tumalsik sa mata, maaari rin itong matalsikan ng mga kemikal. Ang usok din na mula sa pagwe-welding o paghihinang o mula sa mga iba't ibang makina ay maaari ding maging sanhi upang mairita ang mga mata. Kaya naman, importante ang pagsuot ng proteksyon sa mata dahil ito ang pinakamahusay na depensa mula sa mga ocular emergencies. Hmm, ano nga ba ang mga klase ng protective eyewear at ano ang nararapat sa sitwasyon? Safety Glasses Safety glasses ay inilalaan upang protektahan ang mga mata ng nagsusuot mula sa mga peligro ng epekto tulad ng paglipad ng mga fragment, bagay, malalaking chips at mga maliliit na butil. Goggles Goggles naman ay inilalaan upang maprotektahan ang mga mata ng nagsusuot mula sa mga peligro ng epekto tulad ng pagtalsik ng mga maliliit na bagay pati na rin mula sa pagtalsik ng iba't ibang mga kemikal. Ang mga goggles ay umaangkop sa mukha kaagad na pumapalibot sa mga mata at bumubuo ng isang pangharang na selyo sa paligid ng mga mata. Pinipigilan nito ang mga bagay na pumasok sa ilalim o paligid ng mga goggles. Welding helmet o shield. Ito ang angkop gamitin habang naghihinang o welding. Hindi lang nito pinoprotektahan ang mga mata mula sa tumatalsik na maliliit na bagay, kundi pati mula sa usok at nakasisilaw na kislap mula sa welding. Face shield. Ang face shield ay parang goggles din, pero imbes na sa mata lang, ang buong mukha ay protektado sa mga lumilipad na bagay. Ngayon, ginagamit ito pang kontra sa COVID-19 bilang Personal Protective Equipment o PPE para sa mga particles tulad ng virus para hindi umabot sa mukha. Ano ang gagawin kapag ang iyong mata ay nairita o natalsikan ng chemical o natamaan ng mga bagay? Talsik ng chemical kung ang iyong mga mata ay natalsikan ng chemical, dapat nang dumiretso na kayo sa emergency room. Importante ding alalahanin kung anong chemical yung natalsik sa mata. Kumuha ng malinis sa tubig at hugasan ng mga mata ng tuloy-tuloy habang makarating sa pinakamalapit na emergency room. Natamaan ng mga gamit sa trabaho. Kung ang iyong mata ay natamaan o napasukan ng mga maliliit na bagay, importante tingnan kung nasugatan ng mata o lumalabo ang paningin ng natamaang mata. Kung nasugatan ng mata o may mga bagay na nakapasok sa loob ng mata, dumiretsyo na agad sa emergency room. Huwag igagalaw o subukang tanggalin ang nakapasok sa mata dahil may tansya na mas malaki o mas lumala pa ang sugat. Bilang konklusyon, hindi na dapat umabot pa sa ganito. Protektahan ang ating mga mata, magsuot ng tamang proteksyon sa trabaho.
ang ating koneksyon sa kapaligiran. Ito ang nagbibigay impormasyon sa atin tungkol sa ating kapaligiran na nagiging basehan ng ating mga aksyon at emosyon. Ang mata ay isa sa mga pinakasensitibong bahagi ng ating katawan, kaya dapat natin ito laging protektahan. Hindi maaaring palitan ng iyong mga mata, kaya mahalagang isa alang-alang ang proteksyon nito sa bawat gawain sa iyong trabaho. Ano ang protective eyewear? Ang protective eyewear ay proteksyon sa mga mata at kung minsan ay sa mukha, gaya ng goggles o face shield na idinesenyo upang maiwasan ang aksidente. Bakit ito mahalaga? May mga trabaho na kinakailangan ng proteksyon sa mata upang maiwasan ang iba't ibang mga aksidente na maaaring makaapekto sa ating mga paningin. Mga halimbawa nito ay ang mga maliliit na buti na maaaring tumalsik sa mata habang naglalagari, nagpupukpok o nagbabarena ng mga kahoy o metal, Bukod sa mga maliliit na bagay na pwedeng tumalsik sa mata, maaari rin itong matalsikan ng mga kemikal. Ang usok din na mula sa pagwe-welding o paghihinang o mula sa mga iba't ibang makina ay maaari ding maging sanhi upang mairita ang mga mata. Kaya naman, importante ang pagsuot ng proteksyon sa mata dahil ito ang pinakamahusay na depensa mula sa mga ocular emergencies. Hmm, ano nga ba ang mga klase ng protective eyewear at ano ang nararapat sa sitwasyon? Safety Glasses Safety glasses ay inilalaan upang protektahan ang mga mata ng nagsusuot mula sa mga peligro ng epekto tulad ng paglipad ng mga fragment, bagay, malalaking chips at mga maliliit na butil. Goggles Goggles naman ay inilalaan upang maprotektahan ang mga mata ng nagsusuot mula sa mga peligro ng epekto tulad ng pagtalsik ng mga maliliit na bagay pati na rin mula sa pagtalsik ng iba't ibang mga kemikal. Ang mga goggles ay umaangkop sa mukha kaagad na pumapalibot sa mga mata at bumubuo ng isang pangharang na selyo sa paligid ng mga mata. Pinipigilan nito ang mga bagay na pumasok sa ilalim o paligid ng mga goggles. Welding helmet o shield. Ito ang angkop gamitin habang naghihinang o welding. Hindi lang nito pinoprotektahan ang mga mata mula sa tumatalsik na maliliit na bagay, kundi pati mula sa usok at nakasisilaw na kislap mula sa welding. Face shield. Ang face shield ay parang goggles din, pero imbes na sa mata lang, ang buong mukha ay protektado sa mga lumilipad na bagay. Ngayon, ginagamit ito pang kontra sa COVID-19 bilang Personal Protective Equipment or PPE para sa mga particles tulad ng virus para hindi umabot sa mukha. Ano ang gagawin kapag ang iyong mata ay nairita o natalsikan ng chemical o natamaan ng mga bagay? Talsik ng chemical kung ang iyong mga mata ay natalsikan ng kemikal, dapat nang dumiretso na kayo sa emergency room. Importante ding alalahanin kung anong kemikal yung natalsik sa mata. Kumuha ng malinis na tubig at hugasan ng mga mata ng tuloy-tuloy habang makarating sa pinakamalapit na emergency room. Natamaan ng mga gamit sa trabaho. Kung ang iyong mata ay natamaan o napasukan ng mga maliliit na bagay, importanteng tingnan kung nasugatan ng mata o lumalabo ang paningin ng natamaang mata. Kung nasugatan ng mata o may mga bagay na nakapasok sa loob ng mata, tumiretso na agad sa emergency room. Huwag igagalaw o subukang tanggalin ang nakapasok sa mata dahil may tansya na mas malaki o mas lumala pa ang sugat. Bilang konklusyon, hindi na dapat umabot pa sa ganito. Protektahan ang ating mga mata, magsuot ng tamang proteksyon sa trabaho.
Uh, good afternoon to all of our viewers. We hope everyone's safe and well. It's been a while since our last episode of the ITV and it's great to be back. And so for today's episode, we will be tackling the topic of wavefront abirometry as a tool to enhance the outcomes of our patients undergoing cataract and refractive surgery. And as a cataract surgeon, I'm always eager to learn about better and better ways to enhance my surgical outcome. And this might be one of them. So I'd like to start by thanking ahead all of our speakers for today's episode, especially our foreign guests who are participating from different time zones. So this episode of the ITV will feature two lectures by our esteemed guests to be followed by several case presentations by our local faculty and fellow. Um, today's speakers roster include Mr. Ray Siebert from Tracy Technologies, Dr. John Grigg from the University of Sydney Same Site Institute, Dr. Keisha Duyongko Lenon, one of our faculty here in Cornea External Disease and Refractive Surgery, and Dr. Christina Tan, a fellow from the same section at the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute. So without further delay, our first speaker is Mr. Ray Siever. Ray has over 35 years of experience in ophthalmic sales and sales management. He has given lectures all over the world on the wonders of the eye trace device and is an acknowledged expert on aberopia and ray tracing. I think Mr. Sievert is ready. So, Ray, if you're ready, let us begin. Thank you. Okay, we are ready. Hello, my name is Ray Sievert and I'm with Tracy Technologies. Today I have the privilege of talking with you about the iTrace, a device I know well. Financial disclosures, disclosures, yes, I work for iTrace, uh, for the Tracy Technologies company that makes the iTrace. It's a brilliant device. Doctors around the world talk about how it measures quality of vision and helps them understand exactly what their patients' vision problems are and the best way to solve them. I've had doctors tell me it not only improves their outcomes, but it also builds their practice and improves their incomes. I've had doctors tell me it keeps them out of trouble because it helps you pick which procedure is best for which patient. And then they also say it helps get them out of trouble if there is an unfortunate result after a refractive or cataract procedure. So let's talk about the eye trace. When you think about the eye trace, it's good to know what it does, and it does a number of things very well. But the main thing it is, is a wavefront aberrometer, but it's a unique one. It's the only one in the world that uses actual ray tracing, which is forward light going into the eye, landing on the retina. So you'll be able to understand how uh, any patient that you see, how light is used by their optical system. We combine that with a very efficient placido disc corneal topography. We add in pupillometry, white to white, optical alignment, a whole lot of other things. So what is this ray tracing aberrometry we talked about? When we put the uh, ray tracing through the eye, we put 256 lasers one at a time into the eye and we map where they land on the retina. And then we create a pattern of how light uh, lands on the retina, how it goes through the optical system. And so that ray tracing, is an incredible way to exactly duplicate the way an eye uses light. When you have these, you can then create wavefront aberrations. One of the ways people typically look at what is a wavefront aberration is in these RMS bars. Think of it like a bar graph. The bigger the bar, the bigger the aberration. Somebody asked a famous doctor one time, how do you explain this? And he said, hey, no bars is good and uh, bars are bad. So the more bars you have, the more aberrations you have. And there's some crazy Zernike terms some people know, some people don't know. Coma, trefoil, spherical aberration, most of you know because of aspheric lenses. But this is how you quantify these aberrations in an optical system that cause poor quality of vision. And each one of these causes has a, a, an underlying symptom, and each symptom has an underlying cause. Let's try and understand a little about what that means. If a patient has blurry vision or they complain of double vision, that's caused by the Zernike called coma. And uh, 
Also, if they have glare and halo or they have night myopia, a big difference in their refraction from day to night, they have spherical aberration. And then if they have star bursting, they have trefoil. The issue with all of these aberrations is they could be on the cornea or they could be internal on the lens. And so sometimes it's very difficult to understand complex optical problems unless you know where the problem is occurring. That's where the eye trace really helps you. In an example, here is where we put on the left these 256 lasers into the eye. In the middle, this is where they all land on, uh, uh, this is a one by one of the macula. This is where they all land in a real tight cluster. And so this is a very good eye. No real refractive error, no high order aberrations. And you can see on the far right this point spread function. When the, this patient looks up at a night sky and sees a star, they see a very sharp point of light. So that sharp point of light is means that their point of light is not spread out, it's sharp. So their focusing potential and their contrast is very good. So this is a perfect eye. This is a not so good eye. This is more like a cataract. We put all the lasers in, they land all over the place, and you see one point of light is now spread out. So they have very poor contrast in this eye. So how does uh, ray tracing, specifically the eye trace, help you understanding a patient's quality of vision? Well, there are four things that you really are gonna wanna understand because the eye trace does these uniquely and very well. One is measuring the optical alignment. It's not well understood in the industry, but optical alignment plays a big role in how successful you can be with certain types of treatments. Uh, you have to separate the eye into component parts. One of the beautiful things about the eye trace is you can look at the corneal optics separately from the internal or the lenticular. And so once you understand how the cornea and lens work together, then and only then can you choose to operate on one surface or the other. In premium IOL planning, it's good to know who's going to get a good result with a multifocal and who won't. And you can do that with the eye trace. When you customize cataract surgery, you'll get better results. And then once you have the lens in the eye, you have this ability to do post-op problem solving. And you can check the toric axis of a lens in the eye without dilating. It'll tell you if the lens is optimized as far as alignment and whether or not it's the right power uh, compared to the post-op corneal power of the, uh, uh, of the patient. So did you get the right lens in the eye? Is it at the right place? All that's extremely helpful. Let's take these one at a time. Optical alignment. A lot of people understand the term angle kappa. A lot of people don't understand angle alpha. They're both important. When you look at this diagram from Jack Holliday, he's picking out three markers that you need to understand how they relate to each other. The visual axis is where the patient is looking. And that's found by looking at the first Purkinje reflection on the front of their cornea. That's where the patient's visual axis is. You also have the pupil, and you can determine the pupil center. And the pupil center is just nothing more than that. It's the center of the pupil. It's not a constant because as the pupil dilates, that pupil center can change as the pupil normally, as you know, doesn't uh, dilate uh, symmetrically. And then you have this optical center. That's the corneal center. That's also the approximate center of the capsular bag. And so this becomes an important uh, element also. When you understand those three elements, uh, the pupil center and the optical center both reference back to where the patient's actually looking. And that's where you get angle alpha and angle kappa. And so in the eye trace, this is what a, a typical measurement would look like. You see these four white lights kind of in a, a diamond shape, like a baseball diamond perhaps. And you see the three elements. The green cross is the pupil center, because you can tell that the pupil's outlined in green, so the center is that green cross. The white to white, or the limbus, is auto uh, uh, measured. You see these blue arcs. The center of that is the blue cross. So now you can know before surgery, where's the approximate center of the bag? Very useful thing to know, because that will tell you if a multifocal is going to center near there. Is the visual axis too far away from that center to actually help the patient get good vision? And then finally, uh, the red cross is where the patient's looking. Now, if they're all inside that diamond, alignment's pretty good. If they're not inside that diamond, then alignment is a potential problem and a poor multifocal candidate. 
So imagine if you could on this screen, the blue cross is where the multifocal centers, the red cross is where the patient's looking, and that delta, that gap is over half a millimeter. It's a bad idea to put a multifocal in. They won't see well. How big a problem is that, you might ask? Well, about a third of the patients have a high angle alpha and should not get a multifocal. A third. If you knew this before surgery, then the other two thirds, you could be a little more aggressive suggesting it, knowing you wouldn't have a bad, bad outcome. Here's one that's sort of mid, uh, mid-level mid problem. You know, the, uh, the players are still in the baseball diamond, so it's okay. How big, a, how big an issue is this? Another about a third patients fall in this category. And so you really need to understand this optical alignment before you start putting uh, multifocals and uh, very, very advanced lenses in the eye. Let's talk about the next thing, this separating the optical components of the eye. Uh, when you look at the DLI screen, we actually measure the dysfunctional lens index. What is it? Well, this display is great for explaining things to patients. This is the cornea, this is the internal, this is the total. Think A plus B equals C. The patient obviously has best corrected a problem. You can't get them better than that, and they're not happy. And so the problem is internal, not corneal. When you look at this, this dysfunctional lens index, you can see this opacity grade. Uh, it's two and a half on a five point scale. It's more than half is a cataract. They have a cataract. Uh, less than five on this scale means uh, their vision is not very good. In this case, they have an obvious cataract, but it's not that bad to their vision. You probably would want to take it out. The patient sees okay. This score, does not match opacity. Some patients have a clear lens, they can't see through, and a low score, you need to take the lens out. Some patients have obvious opacity, like this one, but the score is high enough that their vision is still good, you could leave the lens in place. Knowing this helps you diagnose early cataracts. Think 40 to 60 year old patients. You know when to take the lens out objectively and when the patient's gonna be best served by leaving the lens in. Here's an example of an early PSC cataract. You can see the opacity in the center and you can see a low score. This patient would do well and you could get them best corrected from this to this uh, E on the upper left. They're gonna be happy. Third thing is premium IOL planning, customizing cataract surgery. How are we gonna look at this? Well, first of all, not all K readings are the same. Wavefront Ks are much more accurate than a SIM K or even a uh, uh, to topography K or a lens star or IOL master K. Not all K readings give you the right amount of astigmatism. For example, here's the same patient. SIM K says 480 and wavefront K says 581. Same patient. So you need to use wavefront Ks. And when you uh, use the eye trace, we have a color external photograph. Uh, Bob Osher gave us this clever tool called the Osher ring. And it scrolls out to limbal vessels. And it tells you this is the steep axis. This is where the dots on the toric should go. And then these other lines tell you limbal vessels in reference to where the torque should go. So you can do a very good in-theater marking and make sure that that all works. Last thing, post-op problem solving. We're going to run through a number of these toric check cases. This display, without dilating, shows you the corneal topography post-op, the steep axis. So this would be where the lens should be. That's the cornea. This is internal. This is where the lens is. Congratulations, you've nailed the axis. You're within one degree of target, but your refraction still shows a doppler and a quarter of astigmatism. So why is that? It's not rotation, it's lens power. This is the toric lens axis, this is where it should be, they match. Here's the lens power, and the cornea is 379, the lens is 255. These, those two should match too, and they don't. So the problem is, you didn't put in enough correction in your lens choice. Let's go through a few of these and take a look. Here you have a quarter diopter if you rotate the lens eight degrees. No one's going to rotate a lens for a quarter diopter. Again, lens power 309, uh, or corneal power 309, lens power two diopters. So you didn't put in enough correction. You should be able to go back and figure out why your uh, K readings let you down. Here's another case. Here's a huge amount of astigmatism post-op, a big lens, a T9 in the eye. And so here's the issue. If you rotate this lens 25 degrees, you're going to fix this much astigmatism, and you'll go from this refraction to the one on the bottom, which is fantastic. Imagine 
how uh, quickly you can just tell a patient, all we have to do is a rotation and you're going to be much happier. Here's another one. A doctor and a half, you rotate, you're going to fix it. You'll go from this refraction to that. The patient's just a quick rotation away from a very happy outcome. Last case, here's a 17 degree rotation. You've got two diopters of residual astigmatism with a toric in the eye. The rotation will fix most of it. You can get them to minus one, minus one. Maybe they're happy. Uh, but the issue here is when you look at the lens, it's a lot stronger than the cornea. And so you'll know that. A couple of other things on problem solving, then we'll wrap this up. Uh, you can look at the lens. Uh, this is a circle drawn around a lens. You can see that the center of the lens is the yellow cross. It's right near the blue, which is the center of the limbus. That's where we would expect it to be. And there's the red cross. So you can see that the angle alpha is pretty high. And so if this is a multifocal, it's not really centering near the visual axis. You can recognize a tilted lens. On a wavefront screen, if you have cold colors on one side and hot colors on the other, that lens is in fact tilted. And when you recognize that, you can see it. Again, hot colors on one side of a green meridian across the lens, cold colors on the other side, the lens is tilted. Sometimes you have an issue and you don't know what the cause is. And once you determine that coma causes double vision and spherical aberration causes glare and halo and trefoil is what causes starburst, this patient had starbursting. And when you look at the patient, we can see where the lens is, where that yellow circle is. We can see their visual axis here and there's rexus here. And if you go right across, there's no rexus. So that's what's causing the trefoil. And so this patient, you would just yag their interior capsule, which was poorly torn and not centered on the lens. But some problems are not that hard to fix, but they're hard to understand if you don't have the eye trace. So with that being said, uh, I'll wrap up by saying the benefits for an eye trace. Rapid testing gives you a lot of information, understanding quality of vision, uh, being able to determine is it corneal procedure best, is a lens procedure best, which eye well to select, how to stay away from patients that shouldn't have a multifocal. You can verify position of a toric lens. Uh, it solves a lot of post-op problems, all specifically to try and maximize quality of vision. Last thing I'll show you but won't explain, we actually do depth of focus curves as well. So if you're getting into these EDOF lenses and you want to understand where to locate the power in a, in a second eye, uh, this is a great, uh, great tool. So I'm sure you have questions about this device. Uh, I appreciate that uh, when you look at this, you might want to contact us. There's a lot of information on our website. You see it there. Uh, maybe if you want, take a picture of this with your phone. Um, and then you can email me. Feel free to email me directly, rsievert at tracytech.com, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you. Thanks again. I really appreciate this chance to talk with you today, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you, Ray. That was an excellent primer on the eye trace. Now, seeing all the potential benefits and applications in our clinical practice, which brings us to the next speaker who will elaborate more about this. Uh, Professor Grigg is head of the discipline of ophthalmology at the University of Sydney Safe Sight Institute. He also consults at Sydney Eye Hospital and the Children's Hospital Westmead with subspecialties in, and I enumerate, glaucoma, cataract, pediatric and, ge and genetic ophthalmology, clinical electrophysiology. In 2013, he co-chaired the World Glaucoma Association's consensus statement on pediatric glaucoma. It is my pleasure to yield the floor to Professor Grigg, who will talk more about the clinical applications of the eye trace. Professor Grigg, floor is yours.
Hello, I'm John Rigg, and it's my pleasure to be here to speak with you tonight. And that what I wanted to talk about was the role of aberometry in ophthalmic practice. Here are my disclosures. I think it's useful to start at how aberometry differs from corneal tomography or corneal topography. I use this skiing example on the hills to sort of give us a guide. So basically the pentacam versus the eye trace. This is structure versus function. And I think that's really the importance of this. We, aberometry gives you functional analysis to go with the structural information that other equipment can provide as well as what the eye trace can provide. And so in some ways the pentacam measures the path the skier takes, but the eye trace measures how the skier travels that path. And that's what we're trying to illustrate here. Now, many of you will be aware of the Zernike polynomials and be aware of the mathematical ways of deriving at these. I'm certainly not an engineer or a mathematician. And so these lovely 3D diagrams can be confusing and seem unrelated to the, what we see in our patients. And I think that's where I've found the eye trace to be useful. I first became aware of the eye trace aberometer when Dr. David Chang was presenting at the Australian College of, of Ophthalmology meeting in Hobart in 2013. At that meeting, he presented his challenging cataract cases. And what I found interesting was that despite being a very prominent cataract surgeon, he was spending most of his time taking out multifocal intraocular lenses. And this really led to sort of trying to work out how do we choose our patients better for the, the array of optical corrections that we have, and also how do we optimize and the timing for people with cataracts. So this graph here is looking at the visual acuity at the time of cataract surgery versus the number of patients with cataract, with cataract at each visual acuity level. When I first started training almost 30 years ago, the people with cataracts had to have a visual acuity of worse than six over 18 before they'd be considered to be placed on the waiting list. We have 612 as our driving standard, but now we have increasing numbers of patients between 69 and 612 who present with some symptoms and are wishing to have cataract surgery. One of the things that I hope this graph might also show is that but as we change the visual acuity level at which cataract surgery is performed, then the number of people increases. These people, also have a higher expectation of their cataract surgery. And so we need all the tools we can to try and individualize and optimize the, the decision-making process for that person. So in the rest of this talk, I'd like to go through a series of cases and, which illustrate some of the things that I find useful in the eye trace. So we first, after that meeting in Hobart in, two, in November 2013, there's no agent in Australia. We, I'm, I contacted uh, Tracy directly, and we finally had our first machine in May 2014. The dysfunctional lens index has been added after that, and I find it quite a useful metric to help to show people what their the cataract means to them. So the dysfunctional lens index is an objective lens performance metric derived from internal higher order aberrations, pupil size, and contrast sensitivity data. It's a scale of zero to 10. And one of the things I find quite useful is when the score is less than five and you remove the cataract, there's likely to be this wow factor. The patient will actually notice a difference. Whereas they may have a cataract and their DLI score is higher than five, then these people may have an improvement, but they, it won't be a dramatic for them. And I think sometimes when we've particularly got people with better levels of visual acuity, we really need to sort of ensure that we are correcting the dysfunction on their lens as we move forward. There's a nice review here, which sort of goes through how this level was established and compares it to other metrics. So here's a patient that came to me more than 12 months ago. They had a visual acuity of 12 and six over six in the other eye. 
the optometrist said they've got cataracts and so referred in. The patient wasn't bothered, but they thought should, they should come for a check. And we can see that in the eye with a slightly reduced vision, they've got a dysfunctional lens index of 9.13. So this is very close to the maximum score of 10. So taking into account the patient's uh, symptoms and they were coping with life, we decided to review in 12 months time. And this is when they came back in 12 months time. Their visual acuity was still six over 12. This time they were noticing some halos at night. They were not quite as confident driving at night. And this time we can see that their dysfunctional lens index has now dropped to 4.2. So we have an objective measure that can show that there's been a significant change in that 12 months. And that provides confidence to the surgeon and to the patient that really it's, we should go ahead and do the surgery. Then once we're deciding that we're gonna do surgery, we need to, to work out well, what intraocular lens to do. And I find this screen, which brings together a lot of information called the IOL selection analysis screen. And this here we've seen, we've got the corneal aberrations, internal aberrations, and the combined. And we can see there's lots of higher order aberrations. Basically the, the red and blue bars are aberrations at 90 degrees to each other. And the, the length of the line is the, in, is the absolute degree of aberrations. There's a nice little checklist here, which can look at, is the refraction normal? So was there a good measure? Are there higher corneal aberrations or internal aberrations? And there's not a lot of significance there. We can then look and see whether for the astigmatism, there's really only a small degree of astigmatism. I think another useful metric that sits here is corneal spherical aberration, because the preferred intraocular lens I use corrects minus 0.2. So this would be quite helpful to use that in this patient. But it's also worthwhile considering if you have spherical aberration on the cornea that's either zero or less than 0.1, because if you put in an intraocular lens, which is correcting for spherical astigmatism or aberrations, then you may well inadvertently induce spherical aberration in the opposite direction, adding symptoms to a patient where they didn't have them before. So here's a case of this from a few years ago now, that left, had left blurred vision interfering with reading and driving. They'd previously undergone two years before right laser assisted cataract surgery, and that had achieved at six over five unaided vision. Now their vision was six over nine minus three. Now they'd like to be able to read unaided. So what are the optical options? So there's monovision, there's mini monovision, a bifocal intraocular lens or a trifocal intraocular lens or a multifocal diffractive intraocular lens. So in trying to decide what sort of optical correction, then understanding the patient's eye and how it responds to light and the aberrations can really sort of help the decision-making process. And one of these points is the angle alpha. That is the difference between the visual axis and the center of the cornea, which correlates with the center of the capsular bag. If it's more than 0.5, then there's evidence that the intraocular lens center and the visual axis center will be misaligned and this will lead to induced higher order aberrations. So in our patient here, where there is 0.617, then this candidate is really not a candidate for a multifocal diffractive intraocular lens. And so we can reduce the chance of this patient having symptoms after surgery related to the intraocular lens we chose. This is a case of a 43 year old young woman who has myotonic dystrophy, hence the reason for her cataracts. They're visually significant as can be seen here. Her acuity is six over 18 in the right and left three over 60. She's not presbyopic yet. She'd like to be spectacle independent. So again, we use the eye trace to assess her for this. We can see here now that her angle alpha is excellent. She has minimal astigmatism. And then we go to the eye well selection screen. We can see that 
She's got a normal trace of refraction. There's no corneal higher order aberrations and there are internal higher order aberrations, which is what we'd expect from the cataract. And so we see those there. And yet the corneal ones are more the regular astigmatism and you add them together and get the total. So when we look at this, we can see that another useful recommendation appears here. So this patient will be suitable for a premium IOL, that's a multifocal or a monofocal non-toric or a spherical IOL, considering that our corneal spherical aberrations are less. So in this patient, we went for a, a bifocal intraocular lens, not a diffractive one, and she achieved her outcome of six over six bilaterally and could read N6 unaided. So the eye trace provided the information to have confidence to choose this intraocular lens for this patient. Another case here of somebody with bilateral cataracts now, they're elderly, they had amblyopia as a child and the visual acuity is six over 18 in the right and six over 12. The refraction shows a mild hypermetropic correction with minimal astigmatism in the right eye and no astigmatism in the left eye. It's a bit crowded the screen, but at the top is the eye trace for the right eye and then the bottom left is the one for the left eye. What we can see briefly here is that the corneal has a large blue line in astigmatism, whereas the large red ones, we know those cancel out as we see as they sum together here. And again, both summed here. So this patient has matching corneal and lenticular astigmatism. The display here, which is known as a chain display, really highlights the corneal astigmatism, which has been corrected by lenticular astigmatism. Now we could derive that by knowing that their refraction really had no significant astigmatism. And then we did the corneal topography, we could see that there was changes there, but this provides evidence that that's the only source of the astigmatism. And so here's important that if we take this person's cataract out, we have to correct the corneal astigmatism, otherwise we'll be inducing astigmatism and have an unhappy patient. I find this, this um, presentation visualizes for me and for the patient quite simply the path forward rather than having to rely on calculations. In my role as a senior academic, I'm often being consulted with, with people who've had cataract surgery and they're not happy with their outcomes. And this is one that struck him stuck in my mind. This is a, a gentleman who'd had cataract surgery uncomplicated eight weeks previously. They tended for a second opinion and they had uncorrected distance acuity of six over five in their right eye that's operated. They were complaining of starburst and halos and vision from the operated eye, some flashing lights, and they were very distressed. And the original surgeon rightly pointed out that they've achieved six over five vision and had really a very good outcome yet the patient was unhappy. And so when we look at this patient here, we can see in the corneal side here, there's some astigmatism here, but what's really striking, and this really gives the, the indication of why, the origin of their symptoms, is that they have all these higher order aberrations. You can see multiple ones here. And when you add them together, that's what the total eye is like that. And another useful sort of screen that comes with the eye trace is a simulated acuity. And so we can see what the effects on the corneal changes on a, a letter E, what the internal optics would do and the total. And this patient immediately said, that's what I'm seeing. And on close inspection, there was just a slight wrinkle in their posterior capsule. There was no opacity, but it was more a wrinkling. We proceeded to a yay capsulotomy and fix their symptoms. Now, normally I don't like to perform yay capsulotomies for about six months, but with this evidence, there was a clear indication and the patient then knew why we we're doing that. And they, we corrected the underlying problem. I think this sort of highlights the power of the aberrometry in being able to separate cornea and internal 
changes, and then to really diagnose the site of the pathology. So changing from sort of cataract surgery to other cases where I find the aberrometry very useful, this is an eight-year-old child who referred for a second opinion as their right vision was not improving despite glasses and occlusion therapy since five years of age. So they had right amblyopia, the visual acuity of six over 12 and left for six over six. They're hypermetropic, as can be seen there, they've got a little bit of astigmatism in the right eye. When we went to their aberrometry and wavefront sort of analysis, we can see that they've got corneal astigmatism, but we can see that that's canceled out by lenticular astigmatism, but they've got a lot of these higher order internal ab aberrations. And we can look here on the total higher order aberrations, and it's more than 0.5, it really is significant. And so what we can see in this patient is that the eye that's amblyopic actually has an increased number of higher order aberrations. So despite all the, the correct refraction and the, the uh, occlusion therapy, the internal optics of this eye was never going to allow this child to get higher visual acuity than uh, where we've already achieved. So very useful way of, of telling the parents that this is the underlying reason, there's an optical reason that we can't correct. And to, so they don't have to beat the, themselves trying to do more occlusion therapy with very little reward. So the, the last case I wanted to present was that of a, a nine-year-old child who we'd followed for a number of years and with unilateral posterior lenticonus. We've been reluctant to operate because at the, we first met them when they were six years of age, but they did have this significant posterior lenticonus and there's some little posterior subcapsular lens opacity. And they by chance happened to come in on the first or second day we had the machine. And so we put them on it. And you can see in this overview of both eyes, the right eye on this side and left eye here, that the aberrations in here, the machine would classify that they get night hyperopia, blur and double vision, glare, halo, starburst, significant number of visual symptoms could come with this. When we do the Chang analysis, we can see, as would be expected, all the internal higher order aberrations. But the thing that really struck me was the system also looks at the refraction at different pupil sizes. And when you look at the two millimeter of small central pupil, which we might see in daytime, we had a myopic astigmatic refraction. By the time the pupil was dilated, we were at a hypermetropic astigmatic reaction. And really, that to me showed that this person's just, apart from having partial lenticonus with what looked like a structural anomaly, they were having a functional deficit that depended on the lighting conditions. So they were never able to um, adjust to whichever um, refraction they had. We couldn't get glasses to meet all the different requirements. So with this information and presented with the parents, we did go ahead and, and perform cataract surgery. The visual acuity improved by one line, but symptomatically and the overall wellness of the child was markedly improved. And the parents would comment that the child was able to do many more activities and was not sensitive to light going out, didn't have to wear sunglasses outside anymore. So this highlights further the power of understanding the functional effects of light entering the eye. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you tonight on a number of cases highlighting how I use the eye trace in my practice. Thank you.
Uh, thank you so much, Professor Greg, for that excellent talk on clinical application. And thank you for sharing your very nice cases with us. Uh, we will have a Q&A portion later with our two guest speakers. And I would like to remind our audience to type in your questions in the comment section. We will try to address all your questions later. Now, before we hear from our local speakers with their case presentation, I believe we have a short clip, a commercial from MOC to play. I don't think that I would feel comfortable evaluating the cataract patient without it. I use the uh, aberometry, I use the DLI, I use the topography, I just use everything. And I think that the bottom line is it's a great device and uh, I can't do surgery without it. And the eye trace has really helped us to triage between cornea and lens-based procedures in a really easy way that is relatable to patients. You can turn it around and look at internal um, aberrations, and uh, we've all been impressed sometimes that the cataract doesn't look that bad, the patient has very real symptoms, and then you take out the cataract and they do better. And this, uh, this, this functional lens index is a way to look at internal aberrations, and it's sort of uh, the hypothesis is that long before there's true opacification of the nucleus and whatnot, that there may be actually be uh, aberrations, uh, higher order aberrations from the lens uh, that we just can't see at the slit lab, much like we can't see the post LASIK higher order aberrations from the cornea. So it's been really an invaluable tool for us in a cataract practice. We use it every day for all kinds of things, including uh, DLI, diagnosis of problematic uh, lenses, problematic cataracts. And I love the instrument. I mean, it does great aberometry. It gives me the K readings I want. And most of all, we love, we love the dysfunctional lens index uh, that helps us really explain to our patients the cataract progression, etc., etc. We found that the eye trace is really useful for isolating problems to the lens, especially the early cataract patient or the patient that just got a lens implant that just doesn't seem to be performing, everything else seems to work and uh, we want to know, do we take this lens out? So really happy to have it. It's made my surgery better. It's made me much better at evaluating patients both pre and post-op and can't imagine doing without it. So uh, our next two speakers are no strangers to ITV. They're veterans already. You've probably seen them present here before. <laughs> Dr. Keisha Duyongo Lenon and Dr. Christina Tan will give us more information and some local data on the applications of the eye trace. Uh, Keisha is a graduate of Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health, finished her residency and fellowship training here at the Medical City Eye and Vision Institute Division, where she is currently faculty in cornea, external disease, and refractive surgery. Tina finished her medicine and residency at the same institutions and is also currently completing her clinical fellowship here. So Keisha and Tina, let's uh, see your cases. You have the floor. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ko, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, good afternoon, or rather good evening, everybody. I will be presenting one of my first few cases using the eye trace. A 47-year-old graphic artist consulted with me early this year for LASIK screening. She started using progressives three years ago, but never liked wearing them. Contact lenses, on the other hand, have never been an option for her. As a graphic artist, she was mostly on the computer, working on the average of four to five hours daily. 
Her ocular history was unremarkable. Uncorrected distance visual acuity was 2050 on the right and 2030 on the left. Uncorrected near visual acuity was J12. Manifest refraction showed that ametropia was mostly due to astigmatism on both eyes. The rest of the ocular exam was unremarkable. However, on tomography, corneal astigmatism was only 0.3 diopters on the right and 0.2 diopters on the left. So given this assessment, I explained to her the following options. Since the astigmatism was most likely lenticular, I was leaning towards a refractive lens exchange with a multifocal or EDOF IOL. And so to objectively find out if the patient was a good candidate for a premium IOL, I ordered an eye trace in addition to the following exams. Results show that on the right eye, angle alpha was acceptable at less than 0.5. The corneal HOA was low. The Chang analysis confirmed that the significant total eye astigmatism was mainly lenticular. On the left eye, angle alpha was also acceptable. Corneal HOA was low. And finally, the Chang analysis revealed similar results to the right eye. As such, I was able to convince the patient that it was actually the lens causing the issue. And so she understood better that LASIK was not the best option for her. Because of the information provided by the eye trace, I was confident that she would do well with a premium lens. And so the patient underwent refractive lens exchange with an EDOF lens. And at one month, she has excellent post-op results with a manifest refraction close to Plano on both eyes. But more than these numbers, she also reports excellent quality of vision and was more than happy that she had the surgery done. So this case just basically illustrates one of the main one of the main benefits of the eye trace, particularly in selecting which patients are ideal candidates for a premium IOL. And to explore this further, here are some questions for our speakers. I think um, probably answering um, just the first two. Uh, what additional eye trace parameters do you examine pre-op? And what is your cutoff for HOAs, total spherical aberration in coma? And I think we all know the answer to the third question. So thank you very much. Hi, good evening, everyone. I have two interesting cases to share with you guys um, where the eye trace was used for diagnostic assessment. So for case one, we have a 48-year-old female who consulted for gradual doubling of vision with shadows on the right eye. She is pseudophagic, having undergone phacoemulsification with an implantation of a mini well toric EDOF PCIOL for both eyes eight months ago. And when we last saw her seven months ago, uh, her uncorrected visual acuity for both eyes was 2020 and J1. So on examination, the right eye had an uncorrected visual acuity of 2050 improved to 2025 with correction, J5 uncorrected. The manifest refraction was a low, was a low mix, a low mix, a low mix. A noted the presence of a posterior capsular contraction with striae, and it was located temporarily from 4 to 11 o'clock. It is also important to note that our IOL axis was at 110 degrees, which was 10 degrees off of our implantation axis. And on fundoscopy, we couldn't really rule out the presence of a mild epiretinal membrane or macular edema that could also be the cause of the blurring of vision. The left eye was unremarkable. So here on slit lamp examination, we can see an in-the-bag IOL with the presence of a mild posterior capsular fibrosis, 
with vertically oriented oblique striae, and these are located temporally. So with these findings, our primary impression was a posterior capsular contraction of the right eye, and this could explain the presence of doubling of vision with shadows due to a possible IOL tilt. And we also wanted to rule out the presence of macular edema and an epiretinal membrane. So for us to clinch our diagnosis, we decided to perform an OCT macula to rule out any retinal problem, and results showed no significant findings. We also decided to use the eye trace to confirm if the posterior capsular contraction was indeed causing internal aberrations, which consequently would affect the patient's vision. Okay, here you see in this slide the Chang analysis of the right eye showing increased internal and total eye aberrations, which quantitatively confirms that the posterior capsular contraction was affecting the patient's vision. Here's the visual acuity simulation, which also shows increased internal and total eye aberrations. And we can also see here in this display that angle kappa and angle alpha values are acceptable. And on toric alignment check, however, um, it showed some disparity um, in regards to the IOL axis. So if you can recall, our axis on slit lamp was around 110 degrees versus 14 degrees on the internal wavefront map. I think this disparity could have been due to the internal aberrations caused by the posterior capsular contraction. And aside from this, you can also note possible presence of a tilted IOL based on the difference in the wave, uh, internal wave, wave front color map, which um, Ray mentioned previously. So usually, um, this normally presents with a uniform um, color map. Um, here is a comparison of the eye trace on the left eye, just to show that the eye had normal results. So because of the diagnostic that we performed, we could conclude that the patient's visual disturbance on the right eye was caused by a posterior capsular contraction, and our plan was to perform a YAG capsulotomy to alleviate the patient's symptoms. So after performing the YAG capsulotomy, the patient was very satisfied with her vision. There was absence of her previous complaints of double vision and shadows on the right eye, and on examination, we can also see the improvement and the patient's uncorrected visual acuity for both eyes was 2015 at distance and your vision was at J1. So these are some of the points that I would like to raise to our panel regarding the diagnostic approach to tilted IOLs using the eye trace. So the first one is, are there additional displays that we can look at as an adjunct for diagnosis? Second, are angle kappa and angle alpha measurements still useful in pseudofake patients to assess IOL position? Third, can you measure the amount of IOL tilt or decentration? And fourth, can you assess the IOL position if it's tilted forward or backward? Moving on to case two, we have a 42-year-old female who consulted for blurring of vision on the right eye one week prior to consult. She is post-ICL implantation on both eyes 10 years ago for high myopia. So on examination, the patient's uncorrected visual acuity for the right eye was 2200 and J12 corrected to 2060 and J4. Manifest refraction revealed a plus 4.50 sphere with a minus 6 cylinder. For the left eye, uncorrected visual acuity was 2070 and J12 corrected to 2050 and J4 with a manifest refraction of plus 1.25 sphere with minus 7 cylinder. You can see that even with the ICL implants, she has a high astigmatism for both eyes. On slit lamp examination, it was revealed uh, that there was IC, the presence of ICLs and a slight bulging of the posterior capsule on both eyes, and fundoscopy also revealed a retinal detachment on the right eye. So here we can see that the ICLs are positioned above uh, the lens on both eyes. You can also see a slight bulging of the posterior capsule with a mild opacity on both eyes as well. So due to these findings, our impression was a regmatogenous retinal detachment of the right eye. Again, she is post-ICL implantation for myopia with a suspected posterior lenticonus bilaterally. Because the manifest refraction showed a high cylinder for both eyes and suspicious posterior lenticonus was also present, we decided to perform the eye trace to assess for any aberrations. We also decided to perform biometry since this was uh, we were already planning actually to do a clear lens exchange for the right eye. 
So in lieu of the retinal detachment, we also advise the patient regarding accuracy of IOL calculation. So here we have the biometry, which revealed differing axial lengths for both eyes with a difference of 4.76 millimeters between the two. And you can also see that the corneal astigmatism, as highlighted by my pointer here, was approximately uh, three diopters for both eyes. So if you remember, the cylinder on manifest refraction was at uh, six diopters and seven diopters respectively, which means that the patient also has lenticular astigmatism, probably secondary to the posterior lenticonus. Angle kappa and angle alpha values for the right eye were acceptable. And on Chang analysis, you can see the presence of both corneal and internal astigmatism for both eyes, which again could explain the presence of a lenticular astigmatism. So even with the implanted ICLs, the patient's vision could not be fully corrected even with corrective spectacles because of this. So Chang analysis on the left eye also revealed similar results with both corneal and um, internal astigmatism present. On visual acuity simulation, you can also see mild internal and total aberrations for the right. And you also have similar findings for the left eye. So due to these findings, our plan was to do a parse plane of vitrectomy with a C3F8 gas, an ICL removal, clear lens phacoemulsification with PCL, PCIOL implantation for the right eye. So two months post-combined uh, parse plane of vitrectomy, examination of the right eye showed an uncorrected visual acuity of 2400, corrected to 2025, and J1 on the right eye with a manifest refraction of 5.25 sphere and minus 2.75 cylinder. You can already see that after removing the lens, the astigmatism was significantly decreased leaving a residual corneal astigmatism. And you can see the difference between the right and the left eye in regards to the amount of astigmatism on manifest refraction. Um, because the patient was quite satisfied with her uh, corrected vision on the right eye, she was also actually contemplating having the same procedure done on her left eye. So to improve vision on the left eye, we were actually contemplating of implanting a toric IOL to further improve uh, the patient's corneal astigmatism. So finally, these are some of the points that I would like to raise to our panel regarding the diagnostic approach to lenticular astigmatism using the eye trace. So first, are there any additional parameters for assessment uh, prior to cataract surgery? And lastly, are there any differences in K values and astigmatism for the eye trace versus the Pentacam AXL wave, which is also uh, an, a wavefront aberrometer? So thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, Keisha and Tina, for those uh, excellent case presentations. So before we go with it, uh, we'd like to uh, hear from our uh, speakers, Mr. Siever, Professor Greg, for their commentaries on the cases presented by Keisha and Tila. So first, uh, Ray, may I ask for your commentaries for the cases? Uh, I thought the cases were excellent. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused about which, uh, which questions you want answered and how, but uh, uh, the, the eye trace is going to do several things. Um, that we didn't really cover in that overview. Um, I really uh, appreciated the uh, opacity in that case where you did the YAG for Dr. Tan. And uh, there's a study out of India, Dr. Suvira Jain, who was looking at our opacity grade to determine when to do YAG capsulotomy. And uh, it's a very interesting study. I could send that if people are interested. Um, also, there was a question about um, uh, what other, um, when you have uh, uh, lenticular astigmatism, what else can you measure? Uh, you can measure the axis of that astigmatism. You can measure a tilted lens. Uh, there was a, 
um, a summary display that we didn't show, but it actually shows um, when I covered the part on, on tilted lenses, if you have a concern that there's aberrations and the lens in the bag is either tilted because there's a haptic out of the bag or the, the bag has weak zonules, that summary display is very helpful to, to show you that the lens is in fact tilted. Uh, on the toric check, uh, Dr. Tan, I believe you said the axis didn't match the physical axis when you did the uh, slit lamp exam on the lens, but uh, apparently that, uh, that wrinkle in the posterior capsule was doing something to distort that lens. Um, it's very important to have good topography information in order to get that toric check to be really accurate. Uh, most of the doctors that are using that say, if you have good topography, uh, then you can count on that uh, that toric check axis and the rotation amount, and they go in and just mark and rotate that amount. So I hope that answers some of the questions, but if, if it didn't, uh, please let me know. And then obviously, Dr. Greg, if you, you heard all the questions, if you have some comments. Look, I think so. Like I said, there are great cases. And I suppose it's more an overview. I think it highlights how the eye trace provided a functional assessment. So you had, you could see what you see at the slit lamp is obviously a structure. But how does it impact on? Because some patients you can see have wrinkles in their posterior capsule and they seem to function fine. Whereas you had somebody presenting with double vision and, and where was it coming from? And I think that's really the power of the amberometry. And I think that was well highlighted in the first case, or you know, the, the second case. Uh, and uh, also I think it was useful for the um, clear lens refractive exchange, how we could identify there was uh, lenticular changes there. So we, I think, what the overview I would say is this sort of functional assessment, you can then educate the patient, you feel confident yourself about the decisions you make. And that's really the key. And there's so much information in the, in the display that uh, as you go along, you can sort of answer a lot of those questions. So that would be my overview. So I think the wonderful cases. Okay, thank you, uh, Ray. Thank you, John. Uh, let's try to get to uh, some questions from our viewers. Do we have them? Okay, first question. How sensitive are eye trace measurements to dry eyes? Uh, anyone, Ray or John, can answer? Uh, anytime you have a dry eye, uh, you're going to have a change in uh, or an unstable refraction. You're going to have uh, corneal changes. Uh, when you capture the eye trace, the way we teach it is that the operator is capturing within uh, a few seconds of three consecutive blinks. Blink, 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 uh, open wide, don't blink, capture. And so you have very stable uh, tear film when you capture the data. However, the patient is going to have fluctuating vision with dry eye. And so it's always important if the operator sees dry eye uh, to capture the data correctly so the data is right for the doctor to make decisions but also then the surface needs to be treated and stabilized before uh, a LASIK uh, can be done because you want a stable refraction or because you're trying to calculate the lens power for an IOL or an ICL. So uh, it's very important because it's placebo based that you get good tear film. Look, I, I entirely sort of uh, support that. For our routine biometry, for all our cataract surgery, we actually, prepare the corneal surface for the patient has two weeks of anti-inflammatory drops and lubricants mm -hmm. just to optimize the surface and then do as Ray says for the actual capture. But uh, I think there's quite a few studies now that highlight that. And so that's what, what our routine practice is. So they get two weeks of, uh, of drops of anti-inflammatory and lubricants. And it's made a big difference when we ordered our outcomes. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have a next question? Okay, how are corneal aberrations measured? Is it measured via placido disc or ray tracing? I think this was answered before, but uh, maybe Ray, you can elaborate some more on this. Yeah, so um, the ray tracing is whole eye aberration, and then the corneal wavefront is uh, calculated from placido disc topography. It's then the corneal wavefront subtracted from the total eye, and so that's where you get the internal. The internal is implied, uh, not directly measured. And so people ask about posterior cornea and things like that. We actually measure the optical effect of posterior cornea, but we're measuring anterior corneal surface with a placido disc, and then we're measuring whole eye with ray tracing. And uh, Dr. Tan, you had asked about the uh, Hartman Shack new product, the AXL Wave. Um, uh, that, uh, that Pentacam version is a Hartman Shack. It's not ray tracing. So what's really different is the wavefront, the way it's measured. 
Uh, forward ray tracing is light going into the eye. Hartman Shack is one beam down the middle and everything bouncing back out of the eye. And so Hartman Shack's always been useful for driving uh, lasers uh, on, on a wavefront guided LASIK, uh, but it's never been useful for cataracts before. So really curious to see what happens when you have a highly distorted lens and that and that uh, one beam in gets distorted on the way out. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not convinced it's gonna be good for cataracts. Uh, Hartman Shack's never been used for cataracts in the industry. So we'll see that I think the jury's still out on that. It's an expensive device. Um, so we'll just have to see, but it, it does try to do the same thing the eye trace is doing. Uh, just, I have a, a personal bias. I think the eye trace forward ray tracing is the right way to do it. Okay. okay. Um, we have a uh, last question. Okay. Is the eye trace accurate even for pediatric patients? If so, what is the minimum age at which the eye trace can be used? Professor Grigg, you mentioned two young patients. Why don't you come yeah. in on this? Well, we've done a, a, a study looking at this in our non-responding um, patients for amblyopia, and we've been able to do, it's really a, the child's behavior, but certainly regularly from five years of age and some four-year-olds, so and anything up from there. And they're amazingly cooperative, you know, but it does, you know, the child, it depends on the child basically, but we, with our staff, with good rapport, we're getting consistent measurements from four or five years of age. I will add one thing, uh, Dr. Ko, and that is that we didn't discuss it at all, but the eye trace is an objective measure of accommodation. It's the only device in the world like that. It's uh, literally from A to Z. Every company, Alcon Design, has eye trace in their clinical research department. And uh, what it does is it has a window that the patient could actually look through the machine at a distance target and then look at a reading card near. And so the, how that relates to pediatric patients is you could open that window and have the patient look at a distance. Most people are aware that, you know, young patients have an enormous range of accommodation and they have a sphere shift of four, five, six diopters. And so it's very difficult to get without cycloplegia to get a good refraction. We've actually done studies where first graders uh, were looking through the machine at their mom sitting down the hall, and uh, we got very close to their uh, uh, manifest refraction. And so we're kind of excited about that capability. We don't talk about it much. It's a lot of uh, research, but with all the new depth of focus lenses and accommodation studies that are going on, uh, it is useful to note that the eye trace it has a very unique way of me objectively measuring accommodation. <clears throat> Very interesting. Measures accommodation. No other machine did that before, eh? No. I'm a neuroophthalmologist, so that interests me in a way. <laughs> so, uh, uh, do you have any other question, Tina, Keisha, for Ray? And Ray, I have a question, and maybe uh, Professor Greg. Let, let's talk about economics. It all boils down to economics. In the U.S., Ray, are they able to build this for the insurance? And uh, Professor Greg, in Sweden, do you, how do you charge the patient for this? I'll let Professor Greg go first. So we have a, a, a biometry fee for our patients. So, and that sort of, there is partly funded by our health system, but there's a gap for the patient. You know, and we, our workup for all our cataract patients is, we have the Iowa Master, a Pentacam eye trace and speculum microscopy. And then we, we add our, all the Ks back into the 3K formula for the Iowa Master, sort of for, for the average there. But I, I base my decisions on what sort of lens based on the eye trace. So that's how I, I put them all together. So in the US, yeah, in the US market, uh, is there's a couple of ways to pay for it. Uh, one is uh, an advanced benefit notification. It's called an ABN, the patient signs, where they're gonna pay cash for biometry, much the way Professor Greg just mentioned. And so that typically is about a $75 per eye fee to do a workup with the, uh, the eye trace. The patient pays cash for that. There are some codes that are reimbursable uh, the typical corneal topography codes, as well as vision loss of unknown etiology. If you have high order aberration, uh, it's, it's unknown where the problem is. And so that also is billable. Uh, we have external photography, so you could bill for pterygiums and scars and other external uh, problems. But generally, most people will um, use this as a screening tool for premium IOLs. And so every patient would pay to have this assessment unless the patient opts out. And then those that get a premium lens, that fee is typically rolled into their uh, premium lens fee. So those patients that are paying $75 an eye 
and not getting a premium lens, you can assume that somewhere between 50 and 60% of your cataract population. So that's kind of how you can do the math. You look at the number of patients you have times $75 times 50% over a year, and it should pay for itself in six to nine months, depending on your volume. Sounds good. Uh, Tina, I believe you have a question for uh, uh, yes, sir. Professor Greg. Uh, either for Ray or Professor Grigg. So I was just wondering for the eye trace if you will be able to quantitatively measure um, IOL decentration, the amount of decentration that um, an IOL will have, or um, the amount of IOL tilt. How many degrees is it tilted? Is it forward or backwards? Um, Professor oh Greg, God. I'll let you go first. I have an answer, oh, yeah. but I want, I want to hear yours first. I'm going to let you go okay first, Ray. But I think it's more, I use it more as a qualitative assessment that is tilted rather than a quantitative measure. I, I think you're Ray better off you, you're better off using a UBM to try to figure out uh, tilt or something like that, I think. Um, uh, there are people that are looking for degrees of high order aberration. And uh, so we do separate the high order aberrations into microns internally. Uh, and uh, that, you know, because you don't know exactly where the aberration is internally, you can't, you can't, on the cornea, you can change microns to diopters, but you just can't do that internally. It's not, it's not accurate. It's not scientifically correct to do that because you don't know where the aberration is. So you don't know, uh, you know, effective lens plane, for example. So you can't really change it to diopters. Um, and I think Professor Greg is right. When you think about a tilted lens, uh, it's, it's enough to know it's tilted. And then you look at the, the uh, quantity of aberrations to determine what to try to do about it. Um, and then you, the, the other part of your question was, um, I'm trying to remember what you, what you asked. It was tilted lenses and uh, decentered. Yeah, so um, there's an interesting study done uh, in Italy by uh, Dr. Andrea Contagalli, and he actually dilated a thousand patients and used an eye trace to measure them and also used a pentacam. And he was looking at posterior cornea. And what he was looking for was he, the eye trace has a tool in it. And I think I showed it, there's a yellow circle around the lens and it shows where the center of the lens is relative to the visual axis and relative to the limbal center. So you can assume you know, the limbal center is the approximate center of the bag. You can assume the visual axis, you know, that's where the patient's looking. And then you can see the centration of the lens. And interestingly, what he found on a thousand monofocal patients is that the posterior cornea on the pentacam, when he expected surprise cylinder, he didn't get it. And when he had surprise cylinder, it was more from decentered lenses than anything else. And so there is a way to do it. It's a little bit, uh, it's not exactly user friendly, but it's a manual system. But on a dilated patient, you can take an eye trace exam. You can determine where the center of the lens is. It will show you that relative to the visual axis. And so it'll actually give you in polar coordinates how decentered that lens is um, you know, and so in which direction and how much. And so there are ways to look at that. Um, you know, so I don't want to geek out too much, but the eye trace is full of clinical research tools that um, a lot of people at high end hospitals really like to get into. But the average guy just needs to understand that it's a very practical tool. And if anybody wants to get into the kind of the higher order uses of the eye trace, the best thing to do is probably contact me directly and I can uh, let you know about studies or, or uh, things that people have done, or I can't go into the names of the companies, but companies have established a lot of the tricks of looking at, you know, the quality of a lens in the eye, um, the MTF of the cornea, um, all these kinds of uh, uh, in investigative tools that we have. I'd be happy to share that with anybody if you're interested. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, sir. I have a question for either Ray or Dr. Greg. Um, um, we've been using the eye trace for our EDOF studies, as Ray has previously mentioned. We just wanted to clarify. Um, can you give us some tips on how we can check if the acquisition of either our wavefront and um, CT tests are acceptable? So I know there's a lot of variation that can occur if the tests aren't acquired properly. Well, one trick that Ray told me was if the refraction, the eye trace refraction is green, then you know you've got a good uh, scan. That's, that's one, that's sort of a quick measure that we have our staff do. But Ray probably got some other tips as well. Uh, I, I would say that the operator, uh, 
when they take the exam on topography, it's the same as any other topography. When you're, you're looking at Placido rings, you want to make sure there's no slice of pizza missing, no big wedge of data missing. Um, you want to make sure that the ring data is complete and, and makes a 360 degree circle on every black white edge of the Placido. And so that's just a standard uh, operator looks at it, makes the assessment. On Wavefront, um, we generally teach the operator if the Tracy refraction, the auto refraction that we get, which is very accurate and objective, if it's yellow or red, that means there's high order aberration. If it's green, that means it's just sphere and cylinder. We teach the operator when, when it's yellow or red to take another scan and make sure that they match. And if there's two scans that match, then that tells you you've got good data. And so when in doubt on a difficult patient, just have the operator have two matching scans. And, uh, and if you have a difficult corneal problem, make sure the operator takes two matching corneal topography scans, and then you know you've got it figured out. And so if you want to have confidence, and that's the word that I heard Professor Grigg, you used multiple times about the eye trace, is that this data uh, gives you confidence because you're no longer guessing about, about lenticonus or tilted lenses. You're actually able to objectively measure it, and it gives you the confidence to decide what to do next. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. If we would like to do a comparative study on our patients regarding data obtained by eye trace, is there a way to quickly extract that information from the device, or is there already a program? Yeah, there's a uh, there's a because we do a lot of clinical research around the world. There's an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I'll give you an example. Mayo Clinic, a famous clinic in the U.S., uh, exported thirty thousand eye trace exams into this uh, 750 cell uh, Excel spreadsheet. And they started looking at big data. That's why I, I knew what the angle alpha numbers are uh, for, the, for the general population. So it's very easy to do. Um, all the, all the, all the uh, information is there. Uh, it's, it's already part of, you have to have an Excel program on your PC, but, uh, but the eye trace is already set up to do that. It's very simple to get the data out. And there's lots of it. <laughs> yeah, too much. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? If none, I think that's it. I think that will be our last question. Uh, I hope you all learned a lot from today's speech, as I did. No? More importantly, get to apply them in our clinical practice. So we can get, can, can't wait to uh, utilize this machine at the medical city. You know. uh, before we go, please fill out the attendance and form by clicking the link posted in the comments below. Before we go, I would like to remind everyone to uh, wait, hang on, fill out the attendance form once again. Uh, and thank you to everyone for tuning in to the 15th episode of the uh, Medical City and Eye Vision Institute digital platform. Mm -hmm. Away from the very first episode, I think that was last year, no? at the start of the pandemic. So we hope we can bring you more episodes in the future. Again, thank you, Mr. Ray Siever, Professor John Gray, Keisha, Tina, and you again for being us with your presence. This is Rich signing out of TMCI, Construction Without Borders. Good night. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thank you.